Well, it's an honor to kick off this TED Talk. So that's a microscope, right? Everybody's seen a microscope before. And if you imagine life before the microscope, uh, the, the whole study of, of biology was radically different. The invention of the microscope changed not just science, but it changed society. For example, it allowed us to identify when there are uh, the, the, age, the causal agents of diseases as, as microbes, which were pre previously, previously uh, un, um, appreciated before that. And uh, our work with the Google Street View cars is part of a, another sort of scientific innovation. I'm not saying it's going to be as transformative as the microscope, but I think what's interesting is to be present in the time when people are changing the way that they, that they think about um, environmental hazards and its detection. So, um, uh, my work is with my personal favorite gas. I think we all have a favorite gas. Uh, mine is methane. Methane is about 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide on a molecule per molecule basis. And even though there's 200 fold less of it in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide, it's still a, a close second place to, to, to CO2 as far as its global warming potential. There's far more methane in the atmosphere than, than there has been over the last thousands of years, and it's coming up as a result of human activities. And there's two key sources of things that we're doing that are altering the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. One, there are different sorts of biological activities um, that, that are enhanced as a result of, of, um, of human activities. And second, natural gas. Natural gas is 98% methane. Um, so I'm, I, I became interested in methane, and I made a major career pivot to expand my scope and leave my sort of home planet of biology and explore uh, far more fascinating worlds that are out there. And that's what I'll be talking about more today. So, the way I have been studying methane in sort of natural environments is, uh, is to go out there and find a place that's emitting a lot of methane, and I might like put a, put a bucket over the ground and then and measure the amount of methane that's, that's coming into this bucket. I'll take an air sample, and then I'll bring that air sample back from wherever I sampled it and bring it to my laboratory. That's a little one of the sample vials that we put air in, and we have that big machine back there with the Thor picture on it. That's our analyzer, our methane analyzer, our grass chromatograph. It's amazing. That's how we see methane. It takes a couple minutes to analyze each sample, and, um, and as a result of, of that analyzer, we've learned a lot about natural and other types of sources of methane to the atmosphere. But what happened about 10 years ago was sort of a revolution in laser technology. So uh, there was a, a revolution in, in decreasing the cost and increasing the, the sensitivity and power of these infrared lasers. Infrared light is the color of light that's emitted by warm objects like the Earth's surface. That warmth heads up to space and, and is absorbed on its way by methane molecules and then re-radiated back down to Earth. That's the greenhouse effect. These lasers uh, work on the very same principles by shining a little bit of laser light of that same infrared color through a cell where there's air samples being passed through. And then you can measure the, how much light is missing, how foggy the air is in infrared. And you can um, suddenly start to, to see methane in real time. You could take a little Little tube, and you could ask yourself how much methane's over here, and how much methane's over there. It's awesome. I mean, you should try it. It's great. And so you can try it. We brought one of these methane analyzers over to the Innovation Alley, and uh, and you'll be able to, to see if you have any methane coming out of your breath or not other parts, please. But you know, we, there's lots that you can do about it to really see the world in a new way. It is just like having glasses. It's changed what you do. And so I got one of these with some some grant money that I received, and I bought one of these analyzers. And and what would anybody do with one of these fancy new analyzers? But I took it up to the Arctic tundra. And so you'll see, I, I brought this very analyzer here, this black box that weighs about 70 pounds. It's powered by a car battery. We dragged it around the tundra. And just like I was saying, we put the tube over here, you put the tube over there. You can find out where all the methane's coming off the tundra. We found some hot spots. We found an area, maybe the size of this carpet, that was emitting a thousand times more methane than other parts of the tundra. We never figured out why. But it was, and we found these hot spots. It was just, it was awesome. We had a great time. So then it's July, it starts snowing in Alaska, you have to come back home. And so what are we going to do with this thing? I'm like, hey, where else, how else can we use it? Let's put it in the back of our lab truck, and we'll drive around Fort Collins, and we'll see what else we can see. What I'm going to show you next is, it's not a pretty graph. It's not the kind that you're supposed to show public audiences. But this is the, <laughs> this is the graph that I made, and I brought over to this company in town. So on the bottom axis, we're looking at distance down the street on the x-axis, we're looking at the concentration of methane. You can see like the green and the red and the green and the blue lines, they have bumps in them, right? That is places in March and April and May where we had repeatedly driven by this one location in town. I agreed not to shame them in public. Um, but they had elevated methane concentrations associated with their business. 
And so we called them up. We said, hey, did you know you have kind of a lot of methane? And they're like, uh, well, what does that mean? And so we went over. We dragged the analyzer over. We dragged the car batteries, put it in a wagon, on one of my kids' wagons. I don't think they know that I was using it for that. And then, um, and then we, we found where exactly the methane was coming from and, and, their, and their place. And it was, it was transformational. So here I am like a a biologist doing gas stuff in my lab and having a good time, and then suddenly I'm actually, instead of just talking about greenhouse gas management, I'm doing something about it. I helped someone plug a leak of methane that was coming out, and I'm like, wow, this is like crack. You know, <laughs> how, how awesome to actually have an impact like that. And so, um, what uh, this led me to have a greater appreciation of, but what's something that I th first thought was so pedestrian and boring became a fascination and a major subject of my research now. And that is this, this um, I'm not sure if you can see very well, but this is a photo that, uh, that a friend, I have different kinds of friends now, sent me of, <laughs> of a leaking natural gas pipeline. And you know, we're familiar with that thing on the, on the right side over there, that's the, that's the meter that brings the natural gas into your house so you can heat your everything. And uh, I've got my finger pointing to the, to the part that's at the ground because the way all this stuff gets to your house is underground. There's a myriad, there's a network of pipes through every city in the country that carries the natural gas line. And this picture is from a piece of pipe that dates back to 1890, right? So there's parts of this infrastructure in this country and, uh, that are just ancient, and they leak. That just happens. It's a human system. And so about the same time that I was getting interested in the natural gas leaks, so were others. This has become a, a really hot topic because methane is such a potent greenhouse gas and um, the Environmental Defense Fund, which some of you may be familiar with, it's a non-governmental organization, and um, they really uh, they fund and uh, organize the science around a number of different um, environmental concerns, and one of them that they're working on is, is methane-related, and uh, they uh, sort of coordinate the science, and they, at a very high level, had partnered with Google to put some uh, these methane analyzers, like the ones I like to play with, in the back of a Google Street View car. Well, one thing led to another, and they said, Joe, do you think you could help us figure out the science of what, how, you know, so we have a, a Google Street View car and a, um, and a methane analyzer. How, could, how can we do something with them together, right? I'm like, oh, I could, yeah, I could manage something about that. And at this point, I have a bunch of pictures of people because another part of the sort of way this whole story unfolds has to do with all the different kinds of, of expertise that we had to bring to bear to move this project forward and to start to have societal impact. So um, up on the top uh, are Taryn Takahashi and Cassie Ely, who work at the Environmental Defense Fund. They're sort of project managers, and they sort of are responsible for, for finding and bringing funding in so I can, we can pay and, and do the science that we're doing and to manage the sort of herd of cats that's part of all this. Up on the upper right is uh, Karen Tuxen bettman from Google, and she works with, with her partners within Google to help get the, the cars going where they're supposed to be and get this whole thing working. And down in the bottom right are two people who helped are, are earlier in this project, Jessica Salo and Adam Gaylord, um, and they were working with me at CSU. And together we started to form this team of figuring out how to you know, get the cars and where do we put them and how do we do with them and who do we tell and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, so we finally get a couple of these Google Street View cars to Fort Collins, and I developed partnerships here at CSU, and one of the many brilliant people who I've had a chance to work with in the blue shirt is Jay Ham. Jay is a professor in, of atmospheric physics here at CSU, and he, so he studies the dynamics of, of air. And air is a surprisingly lumpy material, right? You think of air as like, you could just mix it like that. And you sort of can just mix it like that. But really, it stays lumpy, like poorly mixed pancake batter, right? And what we found is that all that sort of dry, piece of dryer tubing, and that is actually dryer tubing, we don't need to be that high tech all the time, is something that we, we released methane out of to simulate a natural gas leak. And then that's, this is Laurel Street, just on the north side of campus. We had the Google Street View cars, and we drove them back and forth through the plumes. And, uh, and then we, got, we looked at the data, and we tried to understand what is it that's unique about a natural gas leak that when you drive through it back and forth that you can identify as sort of a, a data object. How can you simplify the observation and uh, recognize when you're looking at a natural gas leak versus not? So um, with Jay and our partners um, in sort of the data analysis work and a lot, a lot, a lot of Excel spreadsheets from all the data that came out, um, we developed methods to, and algorithms that we call them to make them sound fancy, to find the gas leaks, to estimate the leak size, to make sure that when we reported something it wasn't a false positive somehow, and to, to direct the drivers about where to go, right? Because the drivers can't be looking at the screen, that's kind of unsafe, right? And so we had to design a program so the drivers could just do their driving, and then we would analyze the data later. 
So we developed this algorithm, and then we started to, to send the cars out, and one of the things that we quickly became overwhelmed with was data. This, is, this shows uh, here about t t a minute of data that we get, so that's 2,000 data points per minute times eight hours a day times three cars. That is um, a lot of data. And so uh, even, even some of our Google people were like, yeah, that's a fair amount of data. I mean, they, we're not in that scale, but it was a lot of data. And so another brilliant group that I started to work with was here in computer science at CSU, Sangmi Palakara and her team, Johnson, Ketch Johnson Ketchikuran, who's a master's student about to finish. Johnson and, and Sangmi developed that, uh, this sort of data framework. You can imagine it's like a lake of data, right? And you might want to analyze it for different times, different days, different... Uh, sensor systems or different other features in, in order to be able to pull the right data out, to be able to analyze it, to be able to turn it into a data product that's meaningful, was a huge, uh, a huge product that we came up with. So once we had the data from Sangmi's computer science team, then we, inter then we had to figure out how are we going to affect social change with this data, right? One of our project goals was to publicize this data, was to show people maps. But there are just boatloads of natural gas out leaks that, that occur out there, and we want to inform the public about it. And so, uh, shown here is an EDF scientist, Reiner Romero, and Reiner is actually a social psychologist. And what he did was he conducted sort of social experiments about how you visualize, how do you represent the data we collected. And after a number of tests, Reiner was able to develop maps like we show in the, in the upper left. Those yellow, each of those yellow dots is a small natural gas leaks. The orange ones are medium. The, lar the large ones are red with, you know, high emission rate. And the blue shows uh, all the roads that we drove on, the white roads we didn't drive on. So we have now um, a way to illustrate this. And then we set up a, the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, we worked on a, a web page to illustrate this. If you do a Google search or, or Yahoo or whatever search engine you want to use, um, <clears throat> for EDF methane maps, you, you can bring this up and you can browse through it and you can see that there are lots of leaks in some cities and fewer leaks in other cities. We could show where they are, we show what the patterns are. So now we have, have a mechanism for public awareness of this. And then the next phase is to do on a much larger scale what I did when I drove up to that company and said, hey, there's a lot of methane coming out. <clears throat> Working with the utilities, um, what happens is that these, these leaks, uh, when, the, when the utilities discover that there's a natural gas leak in their system, they go out and investigate it, which is what they, sh what they should do and it is what they do. And if there's, um, if there's a risk that this leaking gas might enter an enclosed space, like a building or something like that, then they, they dig a hole and they get to the bottom and then they fix it. But a really large number of these leaks happen in the middle of the street. The gas goes straight up and out into the air. And these are classified as non-hazardous leaks. And non-hazardous leaks aren't required to be repaired. They just sit there and fizz. Now, the, what we discovered is that there are a lot of leaks out there that are allowed to, to fizz, and, uh, and that some of them are quite large. And so we wanted to, to, to work with these utilities to reduce the emissions. So. Um, what we did was we developed uh, actually a, quite a number of successful, friendly, cooperative relationships with utilities where we worked within this sort of complex, highly regulated framework and we brought in a, a, a team of really um, brilliant, friendly, smart uh, lawyers who were looking into... <laughs> I'm not trying to say that as a surprise. I mean, I've never, I'm a scientist, right? And so to come to this point where I'm working regularly with attorneys who do natural gas law is just, that is like moving to another planet, and it's been a fascinating experience. So we developed these cooperative relationships. Our, our attorneys helped us figure out at what point in the sort of legal process that we might introduce this information that, hey, you know, you could use some information about leak size and maybe try to, to find a win-win way to reduce emissions. And so that's what we did in, in a huge initiative. This utility in New Jersey was going to spend $900 million. Million dollars. That's a lot of money. And, um, and so we had a chance to work cooperatively with this utility. The utility said, okay, here's like uh, 25 areas, um, not all areas shown, where we are going to be doing some pipeline replacement. Why don't you EDF Google guys uh, go out there and map these areas and tell us which ones are the leakiest, and then we'll go and start and fix those. And that's what we did. We actually were able to identify the leakiest parts of their system. They were going to do some repair of their, you know, 1890s era gas lines anyway, and we were able to direct that. And to me, that's a total win-win success, right? That we're able to say, okay, given that you're going to do this anyway, how can we make this a, 
a cost-effective sort of coordinated effort where everyone comes out ahead. And so helping us in this, I'd like to show pictures of the people because for me, the people and developing these successful teams is a big part of, of what's worth sharing. So on the top is Mary Gady, who used to be an EPA administrator for the Chicago region, an attorney, Simi George, um, with the Environmental Defense Fund, and a data analyst, Virginia Palacios. So the three of us, well, not the three of us, but the, the, our growing, progressively growing team uh, worked together to execute what I think is a real success story where we're starting to impact emissions from cities. So as we, um, as we try to generalize about what is happening next, if, if there is a, an environmental hazard like a tiger or a rattlesnake in this room, right, we would know what to do. It's just part of, there have been a lot of unsuccessful escapes from uh, tigers and rattlesnakes that have led to the gene pool that we see around us today. And so, uh, so there are sort of social systems in place for detecting, communicating about, and, and dealing with environmental hazards. And I think in this day and age, um, what we're facing are new types of environmental hazards. Up in the upper right panel, I show a picture of a massive natural gas leak that was happening in uh, Southern California, in the Porter Ranch community. You may have heard about it. This picture is taken in that infrared spectrum where those lasers work, right? These sort of photos only really work for, with massive natural gas leaks. You can't really use them for the types of the smaller ones that we, we measure in cities. But still, what I'm trying to say is that visualization and management of these types of environmental hazards is something that we need to be more aware of um, as a society. And so as we think about the role of science and technological development in the way that science moves forward, you just throw a pebble in a pond by putting an, a methane sensor in a Google Street View car. But what you're really doing is seeing the beginning of a technological change that has the potential to really alter the way that we as a society, we as scientists, we as corporate owners, we as donors, start to work together to, um, to improve environmental quality. And so if you're out there and you're part of society, which most of you are, I think, then you'd be thinking about how can I gather information about, about um, environmental hazards and, and what that means to me and what companies and, or politi political organizations do I want to support to affect these changes. If you are part of a company, if you are a potential polluter, you should be aware that there are sort of environmental organizations out there that are seeking win-win solutions. If you're a student and you're out there, you should be thinking that the sort of training that you need to be part of as part of a, a, a scientist in society is far broader than you might have ever thought of before. Thanks for your time.